And then I'm going to move this one to answer it. So we're going to start with. Wait, Tammy, what? I have to say hi. 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 How are you? Nice to see you. I know we've both been really rushed and busy. It has been. Like, I just got off the phone. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be late. So, so do I just here. have to tell you that I perfected napping years ago, but I've never told you this. Now, you're not a napper, but I do it the way Einstein did it, oh. which is you lie down and you put a spoon in your hand. And when the spoon hits the floor, you've had your nap. Oh, I think I would be this is a diversion, but I'm going to go to roll and release after this. And we're supposed to do Shavasa or something like that for three minutes. I do not lay still. I am constantly doing, I'm horrible at that. I don't do yoga. I think it's wonderful. I, I so encourage it for people who can do it, but three minutes. So like the spoon would be doing something else. It would not drop on the ground. So, well, you know, my favorite activity, and then we need to start my very favorite activity is nap, sleep, one of my favorite activities. Do you know I found out on my phone that I sleep nine hours a night, every single night. That's how I do it. I'm because striving my brain for is seven. So I, and I, I'm striving for seven. I think it's really important. And most, unfortunately, most days I don't reach that. Last night was six hours and six minutes. Um, and like getting over okay. six in less than seven is like a challenge for me. Okay. Like a stereo, the brain gets very hot. It needs to cool down. I know. So. Anyway, I know, I know. I really believe in it. I read why we sleep. I am such a believer in this. <laughs> I have committed to striving for it better. I just, it's not one of my spiritual gifts. We are it's so not opposite. I'm good at so I don't want to get awesome. up. I can't wait to all get right. out. So, okay. Let's, Sorry. Let's Thank you. We get digress. into the work. And yeah. you've all heard that on the recording. So, but we're glad you're here. Okay. So the first question is in the answer. So what is a normal time frame to introduce a healthy sex life after betrayal? D-Day was almost five months ago. My SA husband is back in our home after a four month separation. We decided to stay together and have been working on us the entire time. We are both in therapy separately and together. We are pressed practicing imago dialogue and trying to create intimacy through strengthening our communication. I know what he would like for our sex life to ramp up, but I'm not sure I'm ready yet. He is not in all caps pushing me and is being patient. I struggle between feeling guilty that I'm not giving him his need and angry because of memories and flashbacks. Is this normal? And when will it stop? So that's a lot. And we're going to unpack it. So, um, Go I ahead. think I can jump in there first, okay. actually, if that's okay. Please, please. Um, so um, first of all, five months is not very long at all. And then you were separated for four months. So it just all seems very early. And um, I, I don't think there's any reason to have an expectation that sex is going to happen now. So I want to alleviate your guilt and say, you know, it seems early. But the real question I wrote down is what is sex? Because, you know, if you're talking about vaginal or anal intercourse, I don't know that you're ready for that, but could you hold hands? Could you do massages? Could you take a shower together? You know, can you make choices that bring you closer and more intimate without having to have penetrative sex or necessarily, you know, oral or just one of the things that I hear from all of you is what is intimacy? How do we create intimacy? And here is the door, which is, um, are we opening up to each other? Are we being more emotionally present? Are we reaching out? And I hope he's saying to you, I wanna be sexual. And you are saying to him, I'm not ready. And I hope that, because that's intimate. So if you're looking for intimacy, you can start right now. Um, even asking this question is intimate because you're being vulnerable. You're asking something difficult and it moves me toward you. The more open people are with each other, the better. So I would just, I think it's a, I think first of all, you should have the discussion with him. I would read this whole thing to him because it's intimate and you need, you're struggling with this. And it isn't something I would keep a secret from my partner. And then the other thing is because you're both in it together. And the other thing is how can you create physical and emotional intimacy um, now as you're moving forward until you're ready for all, you know, more uh, intense forms of sex. And my last answer is, as Tammy's heard you say a million times, don't have sex with anyone you don't trust. So until, you know, he may be acting right, he may be doing great, he may be, but do you inside of you feel safe? Now, I understand no spouse is ever going to feel completely safe, but, and by the way, it is very normal to go from, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, I love you. That's very typical for our folks. We call it ambivalent love. And sometimes it makes partners crazy because they're thinking, 
but five minutes ago, I was thinking I love them. And then, you know, so I get that, but I wouldn't base your desire to have sex on how you're feeling in the moment, good or bad. It needs a bigger um, arc. Like in the last few weeks, how are we communicating? How are we getting along? How are we building intimacy? And if he's really open to helping you take it slow, then, then start by holding hands and walking down the street. Um, so t- that was my best job at unpacking that, Tammy. I think that was great. And, you know, we've talked before on this one, and Dr. David talks to you about Sensate Focused, um, where it's, you know, maybe he rubs your feet, you know, but like, like, and I get the um, memories and flashbacks, but, you know, there are different things to do uh, so that you're not wondering what is he thinking about while we're having penetrative sex? I mean, like all of those things, it's normal. You know, but but are there other things you can do? I I think holding hands, having intimate conversations, like you know, I being vulnerable, both of you, you know, and being seen and heard, that's really meaningful. I hear lots of positive. I I have to affirm, you know, that you know, I he's back in our home. We're we're committed to working on this. I hear lots of positive. So, you know, giving yourself some um some some grace that it's very early in the process but you're you guys are both it sounds like very committed to you know continuing um continuing the journey together so hey tammy oh, yeah did um what i typed in come up because i, I never know whether it does or not. uh it does and i think everybody can see it but i'm okay. going to put it in the chat so, as because everyone. tammy was talking and i uh, and i wasn't what she will ordinarily do is put something so i put a site in for you guys about sensate focus and explaining how it's about building sexual intimacy um and it's pretty much a typical exercise no matter who you read it from this is a particularly good read so um and you don't need a sex therapist you could just start <laughs> um there are books there are you know we don't know much more than you do we just tell you to go do this so um, there's a good article I would get started. Tammy's absolutely right. It's a great place to start sexual connection. And I put it in the chat for everyone too. So you can click the link and go there. Um, so, and if for those of you, if you're on the, um, watching this later, email me, I will save it for myself and so that I can send it, but it's Cornell. And- dot edu sites health just email me how tammy. do they email you tammy, you tammy can't say that t-a-m-i without. at seeking integrity.com so yes okay. happy to help thank you okay next one i'm the betrayed spouse married 41 years in-house separation for six months mm-hmm. so far and full therapeutic disclosure was five months ago SA husband is sexually sober and doing good recovery work with a csat 12 step groups mentor and sponsor things are going with us well with us until I'm triggered by something. If I ask, if I then ask a clarifying question about his past acting out behavior and the connection is it has to my trigger, he reacts defensively. Is this typical? We both want the relationship to heal, but my sense of safety takes a hit when this happens and I don't see us moving forward until he can respond with emotional stability. Your input is appreciated. By the way, I'm asking reasonable questions, not unhelpful details type stuff uh-huh. so so let me clarify for we're sorry Tim, i jump on that yeah what please. what she is saying what she's saying is absolutely right this this person is writing in which is if you're running around saying you know how many times did you have sex and how many orgasms did you have and how big are his or her whatever's that's not questions that i don't think any sex addict should answer because it's not good for the relationship it's not you know i went here i did this that's what we do in disclosure we don't give sexual details and if you guys and i know many of you spouses want those sexual details and let me just explain it's based on experience once you picture the addict doing this with someone who looks like that and then they're doing this it's very hard to get it out of your mind and if you ever want you can't unknow something you can't unsee something mm-hmm. so once you have that in your head and you if you move toward trust and sexuality, it will kind of be in your head like, well, they were with this person. Should I look like that? Should I be like that? Is that what he really likes or she really likes? So d- information, yes. De- sexual details, no. Um, and then Tammy, I think this is an out of the doghouse question personally. So maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, well, yeah. I, so, so a little bit, I'm, I'm wondering because you know, the full therapeutic disclosure was five months ago. So I don't know how long you, I mean, you've been on the journey for 41 years. I got that, but, um, but you know, been separation for six months. So, um, so yes. So we have a work group on the site that is, 
how to rebuild trust, how to, you know, and it's a work group. It's not therapy. We have therapy. I mean, we have treatment at, you know, um, you know, we, we do residential treatment. We address a, a lot of this stuff. It's, it's not just about stopping the behavior, which is critically important, but addressing the underlying issues and learning to have you know, so like, what does empathy look like? How do we, how do we even start um, um, and not get stuck in a shame cycle or whatever? So that's a little bit of what I was hearing now is he reacts defensively. So he doesn't have the emotional strength yet um, to be able to not go to his shame space. The other work group that I would suggest is um, uh, I think the attachment wounds, be, because I have a feeling his judge is coming out and he's, you know, whatever. So, so Troy Love does an amazing job with that work group. So, so there's options on the, the seekingintegrity.com site for that. But, but you're still also early in the journey. I know you've been doing this a long time, but for 41 years, he's been able to, you know, go in a completely different direction, unfortunately, um, with his, uh, yeah, anyway, so, so, so him stepping up and, and, you know, I think having the check-ins, you know, the Thanos is really good if you guys haven't been doing that. I think also having the space, um, uh, like setting a time instead of it just asking a clarifying question and it could come at any particular time, you know, write it down in your little journal paper and say, you know, like at certain times of the week, we're going to we're going to talk about these things. And then he's got the ability to, to bookend it. He can call his sponsor before he can call his sponsor after he can go, what do I need to do? And, you know, to hold for 20 minutes while we have this discussion, you know, so, so it's, you know, it may set you up in a different way so that there's the ability. We know we're going to talk about some difficult things. We're going to do it for 20 minutes. There's support on both ends and we'll come back to it if we need to, you know, come back to it in version two, but but um, that can help just, you know, so that the addict can be prepared and not feel like, oh, I didn't know. And now, you know, and, and, and reacting, which is unfortunately what we do. Yeah, and I was going to add, because Tammy's absolutely right. Um, I don't know about pieces of paper. Not everyone uses paper anymore, Tammy. But if you want to, um, what I'm really suggesting and Tammy's saying is put on your schedule Tuesday night, Thursday night, and Saturday night, we're going to talk for 45 minutes, and this is all we're going to talk about. And then when those questions come up for you during the day, as they often do, and you want to run to them, and, and I'm not saying you do this because it's in the, not in the letter, but nonetheless, in the note, but nonetheless, think to yourself, oh, well, we're going to talk about this tonight, or we're going to talk tomorrow night, or if you know that there's a time coming up, like Tammy said, it reduces some of the stress. When do I bring this up? How do I bring this up? And quite honestly, for us, it's very hard all day long to be in the middle of doing whatever and, and having to answer these very difficult questions. It's not that we don't want to. It's just, you know, I'm in the middle of typing a letter and someone comes in and says, you know, uh, where did you meet with them, this hotel or that? It really doesn't, it doesn't help either one of us. And Tammy put in the chat, I want to say, I wrote a book about this for this issue. I'll say it to all of you, I have never met a man yet in all of my years of work who knows how to repair infidelity with a woman. So I wrote a book called Out of the Doghouse. This is for men who do not understand empathy and compassion for a woman they have cheated on. And part of this is being a man, because we look at sex differently and we don't fully understand what you're going through. And we want it to go away and you to be better and not be angry at us anymore. So what I did, and someone was just telling me this, Tammy, I wrote a book from a woman's perspective. I took oh, all of the things that we do. And I said, if your, your partner probably feels this, your partner probably feels that. What your partner wants to hear is this. They want to hear that. So I gave them step-by-step -step directions about how to heal a relationship where you've cheated on a woman. Um, a lot of the guys I will say want to get to this first. Like when we're teaching our courses, you know, if you're a sex addict, you should take sex addiction 101. If you're a porn addict, you should take porn addiction 101. I do see a lot of the male spouses racing to out of the doghouse because what they want to do is find a way to be forgiven without necessarily doing the work. And this isn't all of you, but I really believe you need to work on your problem. And that is one of the ways your spouse is going to be open to your, you know, giving them more supportive answers. But I actually wrote this in detail, even things like if you, you don't have to do any of this, you don't have to be compassionate or empathic, but you can't stay in this relationship. So I laid it out for them in male language 
very direct about what a woman goes through and what she needs to hear, because I hear it all the time. And uh, it, just coincidentally, I don't know if you know this, Tammy, it is the most popular book I sell by far. And that's, I think, because it's for people who cheat, not just, just sex addiction. But anyway, okay. yeah, I make it well, Yeah, Go and ahead. I hear often on that label, I hear often people go, well, you know, I, you know, I, I like, I, I, I just have cheated. I'm not really a sex addict, and I'm, you know, like, how do you know, and unless you're really, really look, peeling back the layers to look, to look at things and gosh, the tools that we learn in addiction recovery can really help if it was a one-time affair, maybe, but when it's the serial cheating, hmm, you know, it makes me, makes me wonder. And at the end of the day, the relationship is in crisis. You know, this is a problem. Nobody, trust me, nobody calls me that, you know, is just wants to chat because they're having a good day. You know, people are calling because there's problems, you know, I get it, you know, I, I, and I'm okay with it. Somebody said, you you like, that must be really horrible. I said, no, I'm like, I am so grateful for my recovery. If I can give people hope and help them find the resources, yay. And we hear that regularly. And then I hear the sad, sad cases where he won't do, or she, but you know, he, we, we, our treatment program is for men where he won't do anything you know, then it's like, then how as partners can they move forward in a different way? But gosh, that guy loses out on everything meaningful in the world too, you know, it's sad. But we just fix one starfish at a time, right? So next question. My question oh, may be, I've heard that before. <laughs> well, the, you know, that starfish on the beach, it doesn't matter to everybody, but I'm saving this starfish. So that's all we can do is help one starfish oh. at a time. And yeah. I was thinking about the, if you cut a leg off a starfish, it grows back. So and that's, that's true sure that's too. Related, yeah, but... no, no, no. It's the starfish on the beach. And, you know, the person's okay. throwing one in at a time. Can't save them all, but we can help the ones that, you know, we can help some. So, okay. Now there are starfish analogies. My next, my, the next question is my qu question may be odd, but here it goes. Is there a goal for an essay to be able to touch his wife without feeling sexual desire. My experience, my essay husband is doing 90 days celibate for his own reason, and I'm not in a place to be comfortable with sex. We are cuddling in bed, and he asked if it was okay that he feels sexual desire or if he should be working on trying to just feel intimate closeness. I'm just looking for guidance. Thank you for your service. So, Well, I don't think it's an odd question. I don't think you're considering the issues we're dealing with. I don't think there are any odd questions because what we're dealing with is odd and difficult and unusual. So don't worry about that. Um, I will say, and I think this is maybe what you meant by odd, but from my perspective, uh, and I don't know this, but my guess is you're not a man. That's my guess. Because we get aroused when we get erections. That's how it works. And by the way, you don't have to um, necessarily be going towards, we don't have to be men, don't have to be actually heading towards sex to get aroused right? We hold you, we are connected to you, or for your bodies, all of a sudden we get aroused. That, that, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's very, very human. What would be problematic is if that led to pushing you to sex or leaving you feel like you had to follow through something, whether you felt safe or not. I like the fact that you know you're not comfortable with sex. You know, by the way, I've never really thought about this, Tammy, but I think it's very reasonable to say to your spouse, I'm going to need about four months and I don't want to talk about sex. I don't want to have sex. I don't want to be approached for sex. I just let's leave sex alone. And on you know August 1st or September 1st, let's sit down and talk about sex again. Because we do tend to, some sex addicts will seek sex from you because we want to feel reassured that we are loved, we are valued, we are important, you're not going to leave us. Those aren't really good reasons to have sex. So, um, you know, the reasons are because I desire you, I care about you, I'm connected to you, you know, those are good reasons. So I absolutely think it's lovely that you're cuddling in bed, but beware, cuddling is going to evoke the desire to be sexual, at least for us guys. And so, you know, one of the things that I've told God, I don't think I've said this to you either, Tammy. One of the things I tell men uh, is wear pajamas and tie the thing really tight, like make a knot so that, and you know, not the pajamas with a, with a little, what do you call those things uh, that you pee out of the little, somebody to, I don't, I don't know, have one does of it those. have a name? But I anyway, make sure, just wear something that doesn't open up. And I tell the guys, tie it in a knot. And that way, you would have to be so conscious about untying the knot that you can't say, oh, well, it just happened. So cuddle all you want, get her all the roused you want, but I'm wearing, uh, I'm wearing um, my sleepy clothes and 
you know, they're not coming off. So there you go. Simple. Well, but I want to like, cause like, I feel like he's, he's trying to uh, be mechanical almost. It's like, you know, cause he asked if it's okay if he feels sexual desire. And I'm like, I like, if he's cuddling, you like, how would it not be? I think it goes to what you're saying. What does he do with it? You know? So if it's, I'm, I'm feeling the sexual desire. I express that to you, but I'm just here. I'm cuddling, you know, and, and it isn't like pushing, like you said, towards something else. But also I can only imagine if I'm going like, I can't feel sexual desire. I can't feel sexual desire. It's like the elephant in the room. It's like, you know, what are you going to focus on? So, so, uh, you, you know, any other thoughts on that? Yes. I'm thinking about something that the words begins with the word blue and I'm not going to say the rest of yes. it, but I am going to say that, you know, men do have a physical response to um, uh, continued sexual arousal without release. And it actually ends up causing many of us physical pain um, because our body moves into a certain place and then it isn't moving toward a release and certain parts of us end up hurting. So I do think it would be useful for you to, to put a, a number on it. Let's cuddle for 15 minutes. When the alarm goes off, you know, I'm going to read, you're going to watch TV, we're going in the other direction, because I would feel very uncomfortable as a man getting aroused for 45 minutes and not having some kind of release, not just in terms of excitement, but physically, I might pay for it later. Um, and I know you ladies don't understand that because you don't have the same parts as us. Uh, doesn't mean I have to have sex or I have to master. It does mean that I need to maybe stay away from intensely sexual arousing situations for more than a, a few minutes because I'm going to end up feeling uncomfortable. Um, so set a time, keep it at that, but no, this is so healthy to feel aroused. And, but so going to that, re remind everybody about nocturnal emissions. If your body really, really, really needs to emit, what happens? No, Tammy, you go ahead. Okay. I will say, well, I'm not a guy, but yeah. It, so, you know, cause I hear often too, I hear lots of stuff. Um, but you know, like, well, I have to have sex, you know? because they're concerned about blue. Um, but it's one of those where, um, you know, Dr. Rob has shared many times that, you know, at the, if nocturnal emissions, if your body needs to take care of itself, it will take care of itself without you having to do anything for it. So hey, did Tammy, I get it mostly right? Yeah. Can you see me right now? Cause this Not program has really changed. Like I can see you, things no, are better. All I see is your um, picture. So come back. Okay, hold on just one second. Um, so I'm going to pull up from Healthline uh, an article. Barn door. Issue. Somebody put barn door. That's your PJ bottom. Barn door. Uh, okay. Well, okay. I didn't know. Hold on a second. I didn't know I had a barn door. Okay. Hold on, Tammy. I am putting in the chat to hosts and panelists. That's ever. No, I want to, to everyone. Ever, everyone. Okay. Here is a, uh, a link. Thank to things, you. You got it. Uh, to information about how men end up hurting without sexual release for a long period of time. Do your okay. own research. <laughs> yes. Okay. So next question um, uh, oops, is my PASA husband of 11 years left in October, trickle discoveries, some retractions. He's currently not telling me if he would like to work on our marriage or divorce as well as he told me that it's, it's a shame on me that I allow what was hurt him to hurt me meaning his PA and SA acting oh. out over the years, as well as my idea of monogamy is based on feminism. I feel that he's minimizing the damage and pain he's caused in breaking our family up. He's also says he's the most moral person he knows. And to that, I say, gosh, he must be in a really small audience. Um, is this typical <laughs> SA behavior? And can I see that help him? So this is a silly answer. I mean, this is only a little teeny answer. But people who say, you know, I'm really trustworthy. You can trust me. I don't trust them at all. Correct. Because why do you need to tell me that you're trustworthy, you know, unless I ask you. So somebody who says, you know, um, I'm the most moral person. Well, let's see. I'm hanging out with porn. I'm acting out sexually. But I have deep and meaningful morals and ethics. I don't think so. After what he did to you, or I guess he or she, is that right? He, he is my after, S APA husband, okay. H. Yeah. So, so is cheating, lying, keeping secrets and manipulating, having a high moral code? Because if it does, then every addict qualifies in the act of addiction. So I, I actually, when I hear that time, I get angry. 
Me too. Because you are being so dismissed. And by the way, when his when his uh, you know attack on you is what an unbelievable attack. He's talk about blaming the victim. This is blaming the victim. Why are you making my life harder when I'm the one with the problem? He hurt you. He he lied to you. He I don't care why you want monogamy. You do. I don't care why somebody wants to, I don't know, make dinner, but if they do, they do. So I don't need to question why you want monogamy. I just respect that you do. And it might be a conversation or it might not, but I respect that you do. And I think that this is a man, by the way, we are completely full. Our treatment program is now, well, we have one bed, I think. If you no, would like to invite full. him to join us at some point, um, let me know, because this is someone who, who is blaming you and minimizing the pain. He, he's not breaking your family up. I mean, you're not breaking the family up. He is lying, cheating, porn. That's just breaking up the family. And yeah, so I think that he has, this is gaslighting which is setting you up to blame yourself or to minimize how you feel because it's easier for him. And so in every way, uh, I would change the locks. <laughs> um, They're not living together. Here's, he's not telling me if he would like to work on a marriage or divorce. Oh, right. I'd be telling him, you know, right. I, like th this is to, to me abuse, just abuse that he's right. blaming you, gaslighting you, blame shifting, all of that type of thing. Like, do you want to be married to a man who is going to do this? You know, like at some, if you have, if you haven't seen a divorce attorney, you may want to start there and find out, you know, what the divorce attorney says. You don't have he, this stringing along. I see this again, often where it's like, well, you know, so he's out doing whatever he's doing because he's a highly moral person, sarcasm dripping. And then and then, but he gets to do whatever he's doing unsupervised. There's no, you know, accountability for him. And here you are with the house and the family and everything else, wondering and waiting if he's going to be willing to work on the marriage. Will a CSAT help him? I, like that, that is beyond like a 50 minute session once a week with even the best CSAT is not enough for someone who is in so much denial. Uh, yeah, I, I'm with Dr. Rob, like, yeah, yeah. I know what I would do. I'm not telling you what you need to do, I, but I just really encourage you to advocate for you and, and your family, so. And I wanna add something into that, which is um, me thinks he does protest, to, I can't say that, protest me too much. Me thinks that thou prot the protest yeah, all that. too much, yeah. <laughs> In other words, it's if I'm feeling guilty and bad about something I'm doing, it's so much easier to put the blame and anger on you. We have a word for this called externalizing. So my guess he's out there still doing what he has been doing or he's doing it. In other words, it's if I'm having an affair, number one, sorry, he walked out, which is very unusual. Most of the addicts I work with are terrified that you're going to leave or it's not going to work out. And 99% of the time they leave because you've asked them to. So him choosing to leave makes me very suspicious about what he's out there doing and then distancing and telling you how together he is. And, you know, this just feels icky on every level. So Tammy and I have said abusive, gaslighting. I was also thinking passive aggressive, which means he does things and says, oh, well, I just did that. And then you're confused and you're furious and you look like the crazy person when in everything you've said here, he's setting you up to feel and act crazy. So uh, this is not typical behavior um, of somebody who has sorry, has any desire to help and heal their relationship. So I hate to say this to you, but I wonder what he's still up to. That's where my uh, head goes. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's in the PASA category, so. Right. Um, okay, so hello, I'm having issues being intimacy avoidant. I'll be affectionate towards my girlfriend for no more than two days. Then I'll cause some issue to create distance between us um, by lying. I didn't notice this before, but I've been doing this for the last four months of our relationship. What is the significance of the two days and why can't I get past two days to be intimate? Tammy, do you want to start that? Uh, well, uh, I, I, or not. I was going to say, I think you're better at the, like, yeah, I mean, this well, feels more cycle of it. Of, yeah. Anyway, that, go ahead. Well, I don't, there's some things here that I don't quite understand. Um, I, I don't know if the thing, you've conflated two things, which is 
I struggle with intimacy and then I push her away by lying. I don't know if those things are really go together. It might well be that, you know, uh, that you have, you start getting affection, you're reminded of some of the things you did or still have secrets about or whatever, and you move away, it could be. But if all things are great, you know, and I don't know that because this doesn't sound right. Something else is here, I think. But nonetheless, um, if it's an intimacy problem, um, what I suggest that people do is something they never think of, which is say it. You know, honey, I'm feeling, or whatever, you know, Susan, I'm feeling really distant tonight. And, you know, I have these issues around intimacy. And so I might take a little more space tonight. Or if you're dating, you know, maybe I'm going to go to the movies with friends. Or in other words, I see a lot of people have intimacy problems, try to kind of like, what's the word, power through it. Like, I'm just going to, I'm not going to let them know because they might be upset or they might take it personally. So I'm just going to sit here and pretend that we're close, even though I feel incredibly uncomfortable. And the one thing they don't think of doing is saying, you know what, I feel a little uncomfortable tonight because that is intimate to open up to someone and say, I don't feel this and I don't feel that I want to, is to bring them in. We think, oh, if I tell you that you're going to blame yourself or you're going to think I don't care about you or that's what we think. The reality is when we invite someone in to say and understand it isn't about you, it isn't anything you've done, things are just like they are. But today, for whatever reason, I'm feeling distant and I want you to know that. So if you experience it, you don't blame yourself. You know, so in, on, on every level, I think this is about communicating and not trying to keep it to yourself. Lying, different issue. Um, some of us are simply incapable of telling the truth in the moment. And what I say to those folks is set up a 24 hour rule. You know, some people really do have the kind of trauma where, and I mean this, where if they told the truth, they were beaten, you know, that kind of thing. So you learn, if I tell the truth, I'm going to get hurt or they tell the truth and they're abandoned. You know, some of us had those upbringings. So when we say that face coming at us, you know, a little bit like this, we just retract into ourselves and we literally can't say what what went on so i have a 24-hour rule which is you got to come back within 24 hours and say that was really hard for me to say i felt like i couldn't respond to you but i want to let you know within 24 hours that that wasn't true um and you're not going to like it but it is so much better for you spouses believe me to have us come to you and say i wasn't honest but i want to be honest now that's very different than i'm not going to say anything at all so it's progress not perfection these are steps in the right direction. Um, and you got to own your stuff and not try to pretend that everything's fine when it isn't. Yeah. And I, my thought on the lying to you was, um, I, cause I was thinking about what, what is the lying serving? You know, are you, are you being intentional about that? Or like Dr. Rob was saying, something was coming at you or, you know, there, there's something. Um, I also, I think it's interesting about the two days, but I, I really appreciate what Dr. Rob said about like, they may not even go together, you know? Um, so, so looking at them, them differently. And, and if you are on a two days, I've been close and now I need some space. Maybe it's like you plan an outing on the third day and you just kind of, and then you see, you know, I mean, what, what do you need to do, you know, it, it, keep it, keeping on the same spinning wheel it keeps you on the same spinning wheel. So how can you disrupt this, the cycle? If you know that every two days, okay, then on day three, I'm going to do this. If I lie, I like the 24 hour rule. I give it to lots of people and hopefully it's okay. It's 23 hours and 59 minutes the first time, but hopefully the next time it's, you know, the, it gets short, shorter so that, you know, when I said that to you, you know, a half an hour ago, that wasn't th the truth. It gets easier because you are working towards building that intimacy. So, um, you know, what we I'm call that you're asking that what, you know, the great progress. Cycle, it's called <laughs> no progress. Oh, no, I forgot. It's, um, it's a, anyway, it, it's a little bit at a time getting to, like Tammy said, it could be, oh, I know successive approximation. Ooh. which is you try it, you take a step toward it, and then maybe back away and you take another step successfully approximating getting to where you want to get to. You may not. Yeah. So Tammy said, it's great. You might lie at 23.59 hours, but then it's mm -hmm. at 22 and then it's that mm -hmm. same evening. And, you know, you will grow safety. Now, if your partner says, I can't believe you lied to me again, and I don't care about this 24 hour thing, and it's probably not going to support the process. They can say, I'm angry. I want to hear about it sooner. But they also, and I, to you spouses, it's really good for us to tell the truth, even if it's late. <laughs> for us to come up and be honest with you is, believe it or not, really hard. So um, uh, successive approximation, a little bit at a time. Yeah. Yeah. The more we practice it, you know, we can get better at it. So. Right. 
Um, okay, so my husband has consistent good recovery. However, he struggles to allow me to have my emotions, especially processing grief. He acknowledges that he is trying to shut down my feelings because they make him too uncomfortable. He mm -hmm. seems to think that CODA will help us. I notice he has a pattern of distracting himself with new things, new 12-step programs, new sponsors, new books, new check-in methods. He lacks discipline in finishing what he starts. Do you think his this behavior requires adding an additional 12 step. He already attends SA and ACA in addition to Troy Love's group, CSAT uh, led group, reparenting group. So I'm sorry, I have a question. I wrote something mm -hmm. down, but Tammy, when it says he thinks that CODA will help with this, do you think he means that he needs to go to CODA or she needs it? What do you think is that mean? I, oh, that's a good question. Um, I, well, I, uh, I wonder if he's trying so, to shut down her feelings by yeah, having her go to CODA. Okay. So let's I, do it in both okay. ways. One okay. could be, oh, you need to go to CODA because you're so upset all the time. That would be blaming the victim. Mm -hmm. um, first, and also, I don't believe in CODA. Uh, I don't believe in codependency. You know, I have a whole field evolving called pro-dependence, which does not blame spouses and does not put responsibility on family members for an addict's behavior. As I say, uh, thank you, Tammy. I don't think we can yeah. see that, but I yeah, know you can. Oh, you know what would be better? Just so I'm gonna I put a link sure. into it. Yeah. You know, you send a link to the Amazon that has mm -hmm. both new books. He wants to go to. Oh, Coda. he wants to go to Coda. I don't see. Um, I don't think Coda is the right place. I mean, I wouldn't if it were you, and I wouldn't if it were him. Um, first of all, so um, if you have uncomfortable feelings, that's what therapy is for. That's a place to work it out. You two might be in couples work. That might be useful for you to see how this comes up. It's a dynamic that occurs between you. And I don't think it has anything to do with codependency um, or whatever that, that thing is. But there is something else I want to mention to you, which you may not have thought of. And this is my therapy ha psychological hat. People who distract themselves with new things kind of need new people looking for new stimulation. And then they start something and they drop it a lot and move on to the next thing, those are signs of attention deficit disorder or ADD. Um, you know, they pick things up and they drop them. They don't know, they're always looking for a distraction. They, they, we think they're listening, but then they are doing something else. Or, so I certainly would consider that this may be, there may be some biological pieces to this that have not been examined. I would want a good psychiatrist. If you came to me with this issue and your spouse, I would want a good psychiatrist to say, you know, I want to make sure and rule out that there isn't a biological problem here. Because a lot of what you say to me, and by the way, God, Tammy, by the way, um, we don't have a lot of mental health disorders that we are absolutely certain co-occur, occur at the same time as sex addiction. But we know one about 20% of the men and women we treat have ADD, have attention deficit disorder. So one of the things I'm screening for when I interview somebody is, you know, uh, how do they do in school? How, much, how is their attention? Do they drop things on the floor and leave them behind them? Are they always looking for their keys? Are they starting projects and then dropping them going on to the next one? When I hear that kind of thing, I'm beginning to think, hmm, maybe there's more going on here than just addiction. So I would check that out. I don't think this is another 12-step issue. To me, this is a therapy issue. Now, I don't know why he shuts you down when you're feeling emotionally. My guess is it makes him feel guilty. And he doesn't want to feel guilty or shameful. And he certainly doesn't want to feel responsible for your pain. It's much easier to shut you down than it is for me to feel the sadness that I've caused. So I would also think that maybe he's trying to avoid um, the deeper feelings about what he's going through by trying to change what you're feeling. Um, so, uh, and I understand how CODA would seem, that would seem like a CODA thing, but uh, I don't think so. Tammy, we got that one? Uh, I've got, I'm frantically typing um, in, I've given you a whole bunch of things in the chat. I'm just gonna real quickly go through them. So Dr. Rob did a, podcast with Dr. Todd Love, not, not, and he also did with Dr. Troy Love, but Dr. Todd Love is extremely well-versed on ADHD. I added that to the, um, to the uh, chat. And then Dr. Todd Love also did a, um, I almost fell on my seat when he was talking about 
like what ADHD undiagnosed, untreated, like it reduces a man's lifespan by, I can't remember, I think it was like 13 years. It's insane. So, so please check that webinar out. Um, uh, it was on the In the Room Super Saturdays Recovery Summit. And then one more thing, the Couples Healing from Betrayal work group is starting May 5th. We, the, the, the part of the discussion is grieving losses together. So it isn't like he has to just, you know, like there's grief and loss for both of you. And I can't right. help but wonder about the two of you communicating about that in a safe space, you know, if that would be um, helpful too. So those are my add-ons. Yeah. Right. Um... I, I, by the way, don't forget Pat Love, because I did a oh, yes. podcast with Dr. Pat Love. So we yeah, have we, Pat we have Love, Troy Pat Love, Love. And Love. I know, guess but what Todd we deal and Troy, I emailed the wrong person because like, I just, you know, anyway, they, they know, they both know me and they just, right. you know, kind of laugh about it. Well, so I love okay. Dr. Pat Love. I love all of them, but Dr. Pat I love, Love. I love all the loves. Yeah. Okay. Next question. I am in the process of leaving my 15 year relationship. He has been threatening suicide. Ooh. Why do I feel so guilty for moving on and healing myself? He's been an SA for 12, 10 years. You want to start that one, Tammy? Oh, well, I, 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 I am so sorry, but I like one of those things that I, you know, we, we talk often about is, you know, you didn't cause his addiction. Nothing you did or didn't do was going to keep him, you know, from doing that, you know, threatening um, suicide, two things. I, you know, I've had people where it's a mental health thing and they really do need, you know, mental health help. I've also had it be manipulative. Like I'm going to, I'm going to leave you or if you leave me, I'm going to kill myself, you know, so that you feel guilty um, and you don't leave. But it's such a manipulative, controlling thing. And I don't know which category he falls into. You know, if he's really doing his, uh, it says he's been in SA for 10 years, um, yeah. not he's been in SA for 10 years. So, so oh. I just caught that. I just caught that. Um, so that to is me, not this true. feels, yeah, what? That is not true. Nobody starts out being a sex addict at 10, 10 years five years no, into a relationship no, no. Right. he's been a sex addict for 10 years yes yeah so so what i, hear I would is, say he's been a six actually it was since he was 12 or 14 i mean yeah. it's in there early but yeah yeah um i just want like i'm sorry Tim, did i interrupt you no please no please no. i don't um well first of all the word self-evident comes that's two words self-evident comes to mind of course you feel guilty if someone's threatening suicide and you've loved them i mean to me that makes a lot of sense um, and I would feel guilty about leaving them if they are talking about being so overwhelmed that they don't want that want to end their life. But if he has no history of suicidal behavior, of suicidal thoughts, it's just now that this is coming up and they're having, you know, I would say this is, and I, what I experience most of the guys who come in is this is a manipulation. Um, and by the way, if he, I can't take away your guilt. Um, I would remind yourself that you're probably not the one who acted out and there's a reason you're ending the relationship and um, all of that. But the bottom line is, even if your spouse, boy, girl, girlfriend, whatever it was, even if they're threatening suicide, you can't help. You know, you're not a suicide specialist. You're not a therapist. You can only call out an alarm. You know, you could call the police. You call an ambulance. You could call 911, whatever. So what I would feel good about if I were you is making sure that my spouse has all the resources they need. I'd put it on the refrigerator. You know, here's, if you call us therapists, it often says, if you're having a crisis or an emergency, please call 911. And what mm -hmm. we mean is, mm -hmm. if we're not available and you're really in trouble, go call 911. We don't want you to sit around and wait till we call you while you don't want to live. It's really, um, if, if he wants to kill himself, he'll find a way. Trust me, whether you, you're there or you're not. But if he doesn't want to do so and this is a manipulation then i would put on the refrigerator 911 here's the therapist phone number here's the ambulance here's the you know and this is the best i can do for you because i can't rescue you i can't save you and i can't give up my own life to make sure you're safe so you know you have to put on your big boy pants i'm leaving and and i know this is going to sound really really cold but if you want to kill yourself go ahead i mean that's what you're going to do so I cannot live my life based on what you do or what you don't do. Uh, I can only live my life based on what I think is the best for me and the people I love. Mm 
And I encourage you to do what you need to do for yourself. Um, do we love them? Of course. Do we want to support them? Of course. Do we always hold on to some connection with the people we love, no matter what happens? Yes, it doesn't go away. But are you responsible for him? He's not your child. If this were my 15-year-old or my 25-year-old, I would be all over it. But this is not your child. This is an adult person, you know, and they have made their own choices. And honestly, if they choose this, they did it because they wanted to do it. And, they, and there's nothing you can do to stop someone, but you can provide all the resources that are available. And if he wants to suicide hotline, you know, and he'll do whatever he's gonna do. But this just sounds like every, well, two things. Number one, it is terrifying and difficult to be left. And by the way, most sex addicts, we will ignore you. We will be non-intimate, we'll be distant. But boy, the minute you say you're gonna leave, we pay a lot of attention. And it may be that, you know, what he's been acting out over has all been ignited by your, you know, abandonment has been ignited by your taking care of yourself. And these things cannot be conflated, me taking care of myself, how the other person feels. They're separate things. So I'm glad that you brought this up and I understand the guilt feeling, but you're not responsible for that. You have to take care of yourself. Um, and you can't, and by the way, it would be insincere and inappropriate to show up just because you're afraid that something bad's gonna happen, you know? So that's my feedback. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I feel I, he, 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 somebody who's completely committed to suicide is going to do it no matter what. And, but otherwise this is, this feels like shackles for you that you need to stay around because like, otherwise I'm going to kill myself and won't you feel guilty then? So, so you taking care of you, I really like that Dr. Rob said, don't complete, you know, you taking care of you in a healthy way is not abandoning him. He can feel abandoned but you are taking care of you, so. I wanna okay. add one thing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes clients come to Seeking Integrity who've been suicidal and they have guns at home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, sometimes, not, well, frequently, we have to say to a spouse when they're in treatment, or go into the safe, or whatever is, please take the gun away. So if he has a method at home by which he could easily kill himself, I would suggest finding a way to get the guns out of the house. Or, you know, the, if you're one of those people who doesn't ever throw out a prescription bottle and you've got a whole cabinet full, you know, now might be the time to do that. I would want to make sure that I wasn't leaving someone with a very easy method to do that. Um, and beyond that, you know, there's not much more you can do. So the next question, I'm the sex addict in recovery, 12 step in therapy. What is your opinion on starting a conversation with a spouse regarding STDs Ooh. from prior to the relationship that were never discussed? So yeah. I'm kind of, well, I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused, but I'm wondering if, so if you had an STD prior to the relationship, but you had it taken care of, you've gotten the medical treatment, then, then I don't know. I mean, what is, I mean, like, so with disclosures, there is often, you know, uh, we start like there's an overarching timeline for the addict to work on, but you know, the, the disclosure is about what's really happened within the relationship, except to the extent where there's a pattern that you go, yes, I started looking at porn when I was eight, you know, so, so some of that pulls through. So, so that's why working with a qualified therapist, I can't tell you all this in, you know, a minute, but um, working with a qualified therapist to help have a disclosure. But, but to me, you know, I mean, is this um, what, like I, you're in recovery. I don't know how long um, I would talk to your qualified therapist. Cause this feels like something that should be considered for your formal therapeutic disclosure. But I'm what are here. your thoughts, Dr. Rob? Well, I'm wow. here. I wanted to uh, find something to share with these folks. So okay. just give me a second. If you uh -huh. want to go ahead to the next question, I didn't really have much to say about that particular one. So okay. um, why don't you go ahead? And I'm just, I'm here guys. I just want to find something okay. to share with you. Go okay. ahead, Tammy. My question is how long should someone allow my spouse to let off her steam? We have been married for 10 years, known each other for 17 years. My wife found out about two months ago that I struggle with SA and I've been unfaithful for the past eight years of our marriage. Okay, this is my snarky answer. Okay, about eight years. I'm just kidding, but on some level, two months, she's, anyway, okay. So he, her and I were spending some time together and I triggered with, the way I was acting, she said that I was treating her like my wife, but, um, uh, but when she was angry, she yelled at me and I'm not with her husband right now or possible ever again, we are still married. So the simple question, how long should a betrayer allow themselves to be yelled at for all the things that they did? 
That's a lot. Okay. Um, that where is a lot. We start? So, yeah. So, so you guys are so new in this process, but here's what I don't hear with any of this is what you're doing for support. I'm glad you're here. So, so hear that, and, you know, and my, you know, my little goofy comment, you know, forgive that, but um, I have to find humor with all this stuff. So, so here's the deal. What are you guys doing you for recovery? What are you doing? We, we have sex addiction 101 work groups. One started last week. You could join. I joined, I had somebody to add for uh, this week, um, uh, you know, today for that group, but what are you doing for recovery? Cause you know, it, you know, it precedes um, I've been a, a unfaithful for the past eight years of our marriage. There might've been stuff that was long before all of that. So, so two months against eight years or against the 17 years that you've known each other, you know, that, that's a short amount of time. Does your wife have support for betrayal trauma, which is very real? Of course, she's angry. Dr. Rob talked about ambivalent love, you know, uh, uh, earlier. It's, you know, uh, it, th th this is a process. Her discovery was two months ago. You've known all along. So, so she got by, hit by a truck and, and is, is reeling and wondering, you know, what, what else she doesn't know and all of that. So you getting support, you getting a foundation of recovery, you having, you know, a relapse prevention plan, we call it a three circle plan, you connecting with other people who are working towards, you know, recovery and, you know, peer support and all of that, that, that makes a really big difference, you know, in where she can come in and, and get support for her. So her, there's betrayed partner on sex and relationship you know, there's drop-in groups for men who are, are struggling with addiction. There's also for females who are struggling with addiction, but there's also, um, betrayed partner, uh, groups multiple times throughout the week. And we have a work group for betrayed partners. That's how it starts to shift, but yeah, it's good. I mean, you know, and her getting support and you getting help so that you aren't just yelling at each other, which is not helpful for either of you, you know, you getting support and then how do you navigate coming back together again, but it's a long journey and working with a qualified professional that understands these issues. This is not a do it yourself. This is not working with a general therapist who doesn't get any of this, you know, but free, free, free resources on sex and relationship healing.com. I've referred to podcasts and previously recorded webinars. There's bunches of resources for both of you and each of you. You know, I hope you're both here. Um, and there's bunches more all throughout the week. So Dr. Rob. Well, by the way, I'm sorry to disappear. I'm still looking for what I was looking for. I wanted to share something with them and I may disappear again, but I can hear everything. Um, I, to me, there's two issues here. One is um, yelled at. So I don't think any of us deserve to be yelled at. And I know when I'm being yelled at, I shut down. Um, I can't really hear what's being said. I avoid the situation. You know, I withdraw. So I, I think the yelling at part, and I don't know if you really, if that's true, because I know when my spouse says, I just don't feel like having dinner. I'm really disappointed in you. We're having a fight. I think, oh, you're yelling at me. <laughs> so sometimes we can perceive that, even though that may not be true. Um, but uh, no one deserves to be yelled at. And even more importantly, you can't accomplish much. So I just want to say something about couples therapy in early recovery. Uh, I know a lot of you flock to couples therapy thinking, oh, we have a couple's problem. And so we need to go to therapy as a couple. And what you've probably heard Tammy and I say, Mary, often is with this issue, you each need to turn to other people for support. Understand you don't trust. There's no trust there. There's anger there. There's disappointment. You can't turn to the person who used to be your best friend and say, will you still be my best friend when they don't want to talk to you? So we have to build our own resources of support. This is why I'm not a big fan of couples therapy, because basically in the beginning, couples therapy looks like you ruined my life. Will you forgive me? You ruined my life. Will you forgive me? However, the one thing that couples therapy is really good for in the beginning is boundaries. When are we going to fight? How are we going to fight? How do we figure out uh, how to talk about these difficult issues? When do we? So, you know, what it might what might be useful is not necessarily going to, to going to see a, a, a licensed professional for sure. But really, the issue is we have some very difficult things to talk about. And we end up in a place that I don't want to be or we don't want to be. So how can we it doesn't matter what the topic is. The question is, how do how do we manage 
to get through these difficult discussions without it becoming, you know, a free for all or someone's yelling at someone. So the process of how you work it out is something that might be useful for couples work, but the actual working it out, uh, you're going to follow their direction and interact the way that they encourage you and set those boundaries and you're gonna get support for one another. By the way, if you are an addict, this is an addict, right? Yes. I think you really need to go to some support groups and hear how many other people are being yelled at and how they're handling it. One of the reasons that we create support groups, that we encourage support groups, that we um, run free support groups is because um, you guys need to turn to someone who's in the same situation as you and hear what they have to say. And so for you to hear another guy, a similar guy saying, wow, my wife is just screaming at me all the time and I don't know how to deal with it. And there's a guy in that 12-step meeting or in that support group who's already had that happen and has gone on to something better or different. You want to talk to that person. You want to say, hey, how did you guys get past this to that? And if you ever wonder why we're sending you to support groups with all these other troubled people, you're one of them. You are one of the troubled people. You belong there. There's a seat with your name on it. So make use of these resources. And that's what it is. I don't want to go to meetings. Who wants to do that? How about this? I want to go find more solutions to my problems. That's why we go do that. And I want to be a better person. So uh, yeah, get support for yourself and maybe a little couple's work to figure out. Or last thing I'll say, um, hold on one second. John, I don't have Uh, I think I lost my mind. I was going to say one, one last thing. thing I will say. Yeah, but I don't know what we're talking. Okay, I have one thing <laughs> wait, wait. and then you'll probably think about it. So um, the thing I was going to say was, um, you know, she's triggered with the way you're acting. She can be triggered even if you're not around. It can be, you know, driving down the street. I had somebody I was talking to the other day and they were in a in a store and she saw a display of something and, you know, she was triggered and it, it like so. So the triggers, unfortunately, you know, um, or activators, as Debbie McRae says, activators, you know, are going to happen is how you guys handle them, you know, each of you getting support, you know, separately, you're going to be triggered or activated with certain things. So, um, so, it, you know, there's a three second rule, there's so many tools, you are very, very early in this great, glad you're here, you know, keep leaning into the support resources. Um, I am giving a note that uh -huh. I'm gonna to send to you, Tammy. This is an article on um, taking a time out. And it's something yes. that we really, I'll send it to you, I'll put it up here. It's something um, really, really important, I think, to understand how to do, which is uh, things are very hot right now and we're probably not gonna accomplish very much if we start talking about it right now. We're gonna end up yelling at each other. But how can we agree to a, uh, a structure where if we get hot, we step away from each other, we cool off, and then we come back together. So if you actually look up therapeutic timeout or couples timeout or couples fighting timeout and you go on Google and look that up, you'll find all kinds of resources for how to do that. Um, it is not productive to be yelling because nothing gets accomplished. But are, is the information, like I'm angry, I'm hurt, did you do this? Yes, the information is important, the delivery, is important too. I, I remembered what I was going to say, which is when you all are, there may be another way to do this, which is when you're not upset with each other and when things are going okay, um, that might be time to say, you know, I want to talk about what happens when you get, when we get angry or when you get angry, because I can't hear you when you do that and see if you can come up with some solutions when things aren't in crisis so that when they are, you've already planned out what to do. And I agree with that. And I go back to, you said 45 minutes. And I was like, oh my God, that's too long. But, you know, 20 minutes, you know, like having the 20 minutes where we're going to talk about these issues, you know, and having just, you know, and, and, and it, it's not 19 minutes of rah, 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 and then one minute of response. It's like, and set the timer, like set the timer, of, you know, but bookend it. So, like I said, so that you can contact your sponsor you can have the, like, so get, which means like you've engaged with the various peer support so that you have people that you can text and call and say, I'm going to be going into a difficult situation. I want to make sure that I've got support before and after. Like that's how we recover is in connection with other people who have been on this path. So yes, we deserve the seat, but there's other people that are on the journey and some of them are a little ahead and some of them are behind and we're all on the path together. So, okay. 
do you want to do the last one? Well, yeah, there's so many good ones in the in the other two, but what? But anyway, so I'm gonna. So, given the current pandemic situation, what are the rules for virtual dating, video chats? And I'm going. That must be from somebody who's a sex addict, because otherwise, well, why would they ask, right? Well, I hope it's someone who's single and well, wants yeah. to figure out. You know, it could well be someone who's single and they're not sure how to do healthy connection. Um, but my question is rules. Like, what do you mean by rules? So if you want recovery rules, in my mind, if you were to come to my office and ask me this, I would say things like no nudity, no talking about sex, you know, talk about everything else. But if it were virtually dating, um, you know, if someone starts talking about a lot of sex, I'd be a little suspect because maybe that's all they want is sex. But, you know, I think that you can choose to say, I'm not gonna talk about that stuff. And if you're not sending, so sexting is not okay. Um, having deep sexual discussions, mutual masturbation. I mean, to me, it's the basic stuff. You want to get to know somebody. Oh, here's the other thing. If you are in recovery and you are, you have a sponsor, you have a therapist, you're, you're working on these things, ask them the best. In fact, this is my number one answer, which is don't make your own decision or even me giving you feedback. I don't know who you are and I can't see you go to a professional or someone who's in a role model situation with you like a sponsor and say hey i got in this virtual thing with somebody and i'm not sure what to do i have literally seen people say i'm going to call you back <laughs> and or i'm going to chat with you back my phone's ringing or whatever and then they go call the person who they trust and say i'm not sure what to do and then they get direction so in this situation i wouldn't feel i had needed to have the answer to every question i would put the basics down no online sex and then the rest would be I need to check out when I feel, you know, keep, keep a piece of paper. Oh, when people say this, this comes up for me. When people do this and start to add to it. So it's about your being comfortable. And also, you know, if you listen to sex right away that or sexual chat, that's probably not the right relationship. Why bother? Um, so, and all you ladies who are single know that the minute the guy starts talking about sex in the first, you know, conversation, uh, we're not really interested in much anything else. We're all the rest is just BS. So. Tammy, it is another wonderful opportunity to work with you. I agree. I just want to, because you use dating posse, you've used that term before. And I was like, you can have a dating posse, even if it's for virtual dates. So, you know, it can be not just one person that you, but you can have people that know you, that understand your recovery, that are there for you, that understand, you know, you tend to go for that type, you know, the female bad boy type. And so is this person. So, so having the people that can help you watch out for those blind spots can be really useful. So I'll ask say one more thing. If you're questioning mm -hmm. yourself about a conversation or an interaction, pay attention because I don't question the conversations that are going well, but I will quite, gee, should we be talking about this? That's a warning sign. There's a part of you saying, I don't feel comfortable. Pay attention to that. Um, and to all of you, I would say, trust your gut especially your spouses, a lot of the things you're saying are, I think, I notice, I, you're probably right. And if you're not right in this moment, you would have been right two weeks ago. So trust what you're feeling um, and try not to attack because uh, it doesn't really produce good results. Um, Tammy, will you type in our podcast? Because what we do is we yeah, record all of this, every one of these conversations, and then they go up on the internet and you can just listen to Tammy and I talk all the way from here to Oklahoma, if that's what you want to do. Um, all of them are, and then my podcast, which is Sex, Love, and Addiction, is also very helpful. And remember, podcasts are free. Yeah. So yeah. Hey, treatment I, guys, I know lots of people that go, yeah, they listen to them on the way to and from work or wherever they're, you know, and I was like, good, that's good recovery stuff that, you know, uh, and I referred to, you know, Troy Love, Dr. Todd Love, Eddie Caparucci. I've put some things, Pat Love. Pat Love. I mean, there's lots of people. There's lots of great podcasts in there. So, and there's new ones. So check them out. Thanks everybody. Talk Thanks for coming. Tomorrow, we'll hope to see you again. If you need help, we're here. Bye.